morning, everyone. So this, I'm ha very much um, excited to start off the day to welcome everyone for the first series of our webinar series, of course, here at the Museum of Natural History's 44th uh, founding anniversary. Um, yeah, it's a little hard for us. Alam ko marami kong tumakas ata. Sana naman yeah, mapagalitan sa mga faculty po na tumakas. <laughs> Sandali lang naman po tayong mapapahiwalay sa ating uh, University Council meeting and those who are students and um, uh, other faculty, uh, welcome po for joining us. And of course, uh, people from outside the university. Um, we are, of course, uh, very lucky to have a, to, to start off our series for this morning, uh, Dr. Lourdes Cardenas, uh, who will be tackling on botanicals in relation for pandemic of course mom cardenas is our curator for medicinal plants and of course later on we'll have uh, four more talks including myself uh we'll be talking on birds in a pandemic um it'll be introduced later by our coordinators um thank you jen for that start and of course we have a, a, another talk on biosafety by our biosafety officer dr de leon and two sets of zoonosis uh on mammals, one on bats by Professor Viola, and on macaques by Professor Dumalibot. Um, so do join us for the entire day on this um, pandemic field zoonosis day here at the Museum of Natural History. So again, good morning, and I'll turn it back to Jen. Thank you very much, Sir JC. And now we will formally commence our first talk of this webinar series by calling on the moderator for this session, Dr. Emmanuel Ryan de Chavez, Associate Professor at the Institute of Biological Sciences, College of Arts and Sciences, and MH Curator for Mollusks. Hello, thank you, Jen. Um, before I introduce our special uh, guest speaker, I would like to remind you about the house rules for today's seminar. First, make sure that your audio is on mute and your video turned off. Second, the Zoom chat box may only be used for sending questions. So our rapporteur will collate the questions for screen sharing later. Then do not use it for sending greetings or chatting with participants and observe proper webinar etiquette, okay? So, all right, uh, I have now the pleasure to introduce Dr. Lourdes B. Cardenas, who will speak on ramaging nature as uh, botanical versus SARS-CoV-2. But let's uh, give me a proper introduction to Dr. Cardenas. So, Dr. L uh, Lourdes B. Cardenas is MNH uh, curator for medicinal plants. Her fields of specialization includes biotechnology of plant natural products, pharmaceutical biology, ethnobotany, and identification of medicinal plants, in vitro micropropagation and transformation. Her current research involves the establishment of medicinal plant garden under the Philippine Biorepository Network. Dr. Lourdes Cardenas holds the rank of Professor 9 at the Plant Biology Division Institute of Biological Sciences, College of Arts and Sciences here at UPLB. She received her, uh, her doctor rerum naturalium, cum laude, plant biotechnology, pharmaceutical biology from Heinrich Hein University, Dusseldorf, Federal Republic of Germany in 1993. On the other hand, she received her MS Botany in 1981 and BS Agriculture cum laude, in 1978 from the UPLB. Mam Lu became the convener of UPLB's Interdisciplinary Study Center on Natural Products, RDE, a member of the Exicom of the Health Research and Development Consortium, uh, Region 4A under the DOSD, Philippine Council for Health Research and Development. She became the president of the Natural Product Society of the Philippines from 2010 to 2013, and served the uh, Museum of Natural History as director from 2001 to 2006. And now, without further ado, let's hear Dr. Cardenas. 
host, please, to really be here, Dr. JC Gonzalez. I'm very happy to be here in, at MNH. And I feel at ease, and I hope everyone feels at ease. Happy anniversary to everyone. So I'm going to present a talk which was uh, requested of me a few a month back. Uh, and uh, this was presented, nevertheless, I change it. That's why <laughs> I submitted my PowerPoint late. I change it because the focus is biodiversity. And true enough, what I'm going to present is actually a baby of MNH. So when I say a baby of MNH, the title of the talk is Ramaging Nature's Arsenal, looking at botanicals against the COVID-19 virus. And the initial work, uh, the, the, the researchers that I'm going to cite are actually, or rather they have started in the next when we were doing field work. So without uh, much ado, further much ado, I'm going to present the plant as a source of, um, as an arsenal against the virus, and then a little bit of information on the virus itself before presenting again the way by which the plant can attack this. And I'm going at the end to cite two researches which we have uh, we have performed or we have pursued here in UPLB, leading to more studies about plants that can have this um, this therapeutic property, which can be of help for the virus. Let me share the screen now for the presentation. So we know of the plant and the plant is as the primary products by fibers, vitamins, and minerals. And I realized depending on your generation, something will be highlighted, like have the vitamins, good for roughage, and so on. But in the last few years or other decades, the phytochemicals came into the media. And you will hear about the even in advertisements on TV, you will hear about alkaloids, flavonoids, and so on. So there are phytochemicals in plants, not necessarily to help us have the energy, but something that will help us improve life. And in this case, some of them are medicinals. And if you look back in history, about 121 years ago, the first tablet, which is aspirin in, in, a, in a tablet form. The first medicine commercially sold was aspirin, and this is the earliest bottle produced at the Bayer, Bayer uh, company in Germany. Later, France also produced the, the, the aspirin, and this was sold 120 years before. It comes from a plant known as Salix alba, and if you consider Salix alba, it's the prairie red um, um, willow. And even centuries back, people knew that they can use it for pain relief. So they're using it for pain relief. You look through the history of aspirin. Even now it's tested for cancer. It is used, remember, it's used for, for um, some skin problems because it is caustic. And salicylic acid is there in the salix alba extract, which is a component of your aspirin. If you look at the Philippine setting, of course, this is um, very important and medicinal plants is really here in the Philippines. It is the primary healthcare source. And this picture was taken in Palawan uh, and uh, this was in the 1990s. That is the actual preparation they have a typical uh, medicinal plant, which I know, I, I, I presume everybody in the room knows this, is your bayabas. Bayabas is used for panglangas, it is used for the toothache, and so on. And we know that there are essential oils which serve as antimicrobial. There is also tannins, there are also tannins there which help um, heal wounds and many other activities. Actually, it's well studied, bayabas is well studied. And for those um, in the microbiology field, they, they also tested which particular uh, bacterium is attacked by your essential oils from your bayabas. It's also good then as a gargle, as a mouth gargle. Now let's switch to the plants in the recent months, which had been used for 
uh, to test whether it can work against SARS-CoV-2, the virus of COVID-19. You remember the first one, one of the earliest, which was tested in the United States, and it's posted there, hydrochloroquine. Hydrochloroquine, chloroquine, and quinine are actually derivatives from Cinchona, Modica, from Cinchona species. All Cinchona species, as listed in the pharmacopoeia, contain this uh, quinine and derivatives. This is a picture of our quinine, or rather of our Cinchona molokana, coming from Bukidnon. And they, they, they tested hydrochloroquine and they started clinical trial in the United States. But as I was reading my pharmacognosy book, I was surprised because when you look at the, at least when you look at chloroquine, the attack is really on the um, organism which caused the malaria. And in this case, we have friends from the zoology. We know about the plasmodium carried by, by some by some vectors, and then the attack is on the sky ski sort of this particular microorganism. And actually, the, the mechanism of action is the chloroquine prevents the cyclization or polymerization rather of the heme and free heme, heme and hemoglobin are tied up with protein. If it doesn't work, there will be free heme, and it is the free heme which is toxic to the organism. So I said, if that is the case, it might not really work against the virus. So uh, this was a stop. There, there are also studies that showed there are effects on the heart rhythm. So the danger of just taking the, the medicine, be it herbal or not, is always there. So the clinical trial was stopped. In the Philippines, BCO is being tested. Now you hear the news. And we know that the coconut contains lauric acid, which is, um, which is converted to monolaurin in our body. And there are studies that show it is, has its antiviral activity. And some of the cited um, mechanism of action is the disruption of the viral membrane, and then the locking of the organism on the cell host is lessened. And at the same time, there is the negative effect on the membrane protein. So personally, I am really hoping this works because it's, it's, um, it is uh, not expensive, it is uh, safe, relatively safe, and we have lots and lots of LCO. So uh, this is good if it, really, it can really help um, in the fight against COVID-19. COVID the other one is little B, the first, um, the first material or the first um, herbal plant that was commercialized and technology transferred to the industry. And there are reports of the, its antiviral property. Nevertheless, the relaxation of the, of, of the airways, the muscles of the airways, its antihistamine activity, anti-inflammatory activity, and the antiviral have been mentioned. But to really pinpoint which particular component acts or act on all this, uh, it's not yet that clear. Flavonoid, uh, a group of phytochemicals was cited for the first the relaxation of the, of the muscles of the airways, but that is yet to be confirmed in the other studies. Uh, I'd like to um, segue a bit at this point. When I was a student, uh, younger years, I thought things had already been settled. Uh, for example, for a chichirica, a plant that I work on, 1950s, it's known to be working for cancer, specifically for a specific type of cancer, leukemia, and so on. The structure is known. But when I went to Germany to study, I realized that actually, even if there is an epoxide functional chain and so on, and there are proposals, actually, to really pinpoint the mechanism of action is sometimes not so clear, even for plants and medicines that we're using. So let us not feel bad if some of the studies are not yet that right. And true enough, even the structure of a particular component that had been accepted through the years might change in time. You know, what's the reason? The reason is if you have advancement in equipment, 
and in technology. Then you see what was the mistake before. So it is understandable, iterative also. There are changes through time. The other one, which is also being tested now in the Philippines, is euphorbia hirta. And uh, you know the, the issue on this one, it had been there for years. It helps in dengue, it is assumed. It is, it is sometimes, even in the earlier years, the doctors will not officially say it, but some doctors will say, try this if you have dengue and so on. And uh, in this case, um, Tawa Tawa is there. Being studied, report as an antiviral is there. But again, the component has yet to be tested. Uh, the components that work on this are yet to be tested. I also checked some of the interview. Uh, I'm not a medical doctor, so I also listened to interview of medical doctors, left and right, reputable doctors. And one doctor said that if you see the platelet, the platelet count rising even after dengue, uh, a doctor explained that that is the natural thing that will happen with the disease. So uh, um, there is a term that they give for the disease. You have to know, if it's an experiment, you have to know the control, what will really happen, and if platelet will really rise up at that point, or is Tawa Tawa helpful? If the patient is taking this, is Tawa Tawa really helpful to increase the platelet count? So a number of studies has yet to be done, and I'm glad UP Manila and some other and some other universities with hospitals are already, whether we like it or not, no, with COVID-19, we really have to get into drug discovery and development. And the clinical trial is there and being done. Take note that for COVID-19, we do not have the time to do uh, preclinical trials. That's the reason why worldwide, what are being tested are already known drugs because the safety to an extent is there although it will be used for some other purpose. So in this case, the drugs are being repurposed. But for COVID-19, you can see that the study is not hit or miss. You don't do a rummaging, going into, uh, into um, what, um, a baol, <laughs> looking for your arsenals, or going into a warehouse looking for your arsenal. It has to be targeted. You have to know your enemy. You have to know how to deal with it. That's the reason why when it was um, presented to us, hey, a uh, proposal, research proposal for COVID-19 to, to, to fight SARS-CoV-2, the virus, I was not really keen because I know it's, it's, uh, it's a big thing. First, you have to know the enemy. Second, I said, if it is a matter of killing the virus while it is outside, we might as well use soap and water, which we have. I mean, not killing because virus is actually not alive, but uh, trying to arrest the, the, the entity from infecting the people. I said, soap and water would be enough. So why bother with botanicals? If it gets into the cell of the, uh, the body of the person, and into the cell of human, human being, then that's another story. And we have to know the mechanism of action. And at the same time, to test it, to test how to, to see the bioavailability of the plant material that you want to test, the plant substance that you want to test. You have to check the toxicity. You have to, che to check all these things to really say, that it's working as an antiviral within the cell of the host or of the, of the person infected with COVID-19. So this uh, underlines the, po the, the point that drug discovery and development is really a concerted effort among different uh, fields and uh, different researchers and individuals. So in that case, let's get to know a little bit of the coronavirus. This is taken. I cited the source of this. I this is a public domain thing. Simplified. It's a virus. It's just what a membrane with an envelope, and then the a positive single-stranded RNA inside, and that's simple. But the coat contains the proteins. You have the red one, the spike proteins, 
and then the envelope protein with the orange color, and then the membrane protein, smaller bits attached to the covering of the virus. Later studies in uh, April and May, they, uh, they were able to check on the certain sequences which are polybasic, which will be helpful, which will affect the immune system, which will, which will decide whether the infection is, is strong, they can readily get in into the body. So you see these red things, the spike, the spike proteins, these are the ones that help the virus lodge on the host cell, to attack the host cell. And you have seen um, uh, the ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, the receptors of that in the human cell is said to be the one which helps the, the spike protein attach to the human cell. So you can check this out even in Google and of course in, in reputable uh, studies. There are many studies on this. And when they know about the structure of the enemy, then they're better able to attack. And if you've seen the remdesivir, those, uh, those um, medications with BIR at the end, check the pharmacography, check the books, or even Google it up, Google it. You can see that these are the ones attacking the RNA inside. But you can also attack the membrane protein, also attack the spike protein, and there are a number of uh, techniques which is used. It can be simple substance that can wash it away, or it can be intercalation into the DNA of certain substances. And this is where we're going to make the switch and look at, uh, a look at this in a deeper way. I appreciate the, the link given by a student previous semester about the potential of plant components like alkaloids and other plant secondary metabolites against the virus. And take note that in this study, um, Michael Wink, Professor Michael Wink, presented two approaches. You can see the virus as a free viral particle outside of the cell, human cell. And in this case, as I've said, water, soap, um, alcohol, this can already help arrest the infection or prevent the infection. And if it's coming from the plant, we have the essential oils and phenolics acting on this. Essential oils will, will also cause the membrane, disruption of the membrane. You have also saponins that can be considered there, like sabon, saponins, you have hydrophilic, hydrophobic end, and then it will attack the lipid layer, the membrane, and it can attack the proteins. You can also have phenolics, phenolics when you have hydroxyl group, and for example, tannins, yung panglanggas ng bayabas, no? when you have guava and you have panglanggas, you can see the, the feeling, the astringent effect on the skin and on the wound, and you can remove the free viral particles in that case. The, the problem is really when the virus enters the host, how will we do it? And when it enters the host, typically it will remove its envelope and then it's the RNA which will integrate into the genome of the host, uh, cause um, multiplication, and then cause disruption of the, the, of the metabolism of the host cell. So how can that be prevented? If coming from plant, what was suggested by uh, Professor Wink are certain alkaloids, the isoquinoline, the quinoline, and other alkaloids. This, this, was, uh, this was his suggestion in his 2020 article duly published in Diversity 2020. So you can really see that there can be uh, arsenal back on in the plant kingdom against the virus. There are approaches, molecular approaches, as I've said, antiviral where the sequence are tampered, the, the virus sequence, RNA sequence are tampered, but there can also be natural um, plant-based substances that can do this. Again, when I was thinking about this, of course we can, 
We can work on it, watch what are the plants with isoquinoline, quinoline, and other alkaloids that intercalate and intercalate with the DNA. But when you think about it, you cannot just take it in because you have your own genome. You can have what is the bioavailability, how it will react in the tummy and so on. We need people in the other field to do this. And I'm at the botany side, a little bit in the chemistry, but I don't know that side. So we really have to interact and uh, that we just put it this way also, you can, we can be good in clinical studies. We have strong researchers here and we are aiming for that in a research proposal. So let me just cite two researches which we have done connected with MNH that deals with some of the plants that can provide this. If free viral, I just placed a picture of this familiar to you, oregano. Carbacrol is high in the essential oil of oregano and it's known to be antimicrobial. So outwardly, you can have essential oil rich plants washing off, it can help. But internally, this is a source of alkaloid. This is a Berberis barandana. If anyone is coming, somebody is coming from St. Louis and I've, I've seen somebody from Pangasinan also. But in the highlands, in the Philippines, when you consider the diversity of plants, you have certain areas which will contain this temperate plant known as berberine. And uh, this is in Mount Pulag. Take note of the sharp spines. MNH help us to produce this output. You have uh, Mam Aguilar, Mary Ann Cajano. Mary Ann was really um, my co-researcher in a number of years, for a number of years. We have the monograph of Pulag, Berberin is included there, and then the other one is Iserog. This was published, take note of the years, this was published in 2000, in 1998-97, collection of plants became difficult. You remember EO247, which really supported because we really have to check how our plants are being used. So at that time, we just documented took pictures, not to collect, but passed through it. But I came back in 1998 and I still remember the temporary plants that I knew as medicinal. So when I see berberries, I knew even by its look and even when you prick the wood without collecting, you just prick the wood, you can see the yellow berberine. So berberine is there. And it is an isoquinoline alkaloid, 2000. It takes eight years, seven years at that, before I was able to apply permit to collect berberis in Mount Pulag. And this is the picture of PAMBI, Protected Area Management Board, headed by the different um, barangay captain. And I'm thankful to PASU, Press Protected Area Superintendent uh, Mering Albas, because she was the one who also helped pull together for me to be able to get the permit. That's already 2008. And if you consider biodiversity and conservation, they are not conserving the plant. The reason for that is the presence of the spine. One of the barangay captains showed me, can you see the fingers with this, um, this scar, two scar? And the two scars are due to Berberis uh, um, pricking. So it is considered a weed. They're removing it. They would rather remove it. They cannot see, they couldn't see the sense in having it there. And that's the problem. I have to, that's the irony. Have to file a permit, talk, take time, wait for the permit before I can even work on the plant. And thankful to Anna, Mary Ann Cajano, and this was in 2008. We're looking at the Burberry stand in Mount Pulag. And NRCP, I applied for NRCP um, fund, validation of the medicinal plants in that area. It's easy, it's not a problem to extract. We did this in the lab. We're able to get crystals of this and to test whether it's really Berberin. If you know Paul Elag, Dr. Leopold Elag, who's staying in Stock Stockholm. Uh, one of the masters, his master's students are trying to, to work on another technique. Um, 
It's another um, PLC type of technique, but using sophisticated way of doing it, matrix-free assisted thin layer chromatography. And the structure of Berberin is good for this type of testing the technique. So he was able to detect the presence, the yield, confirm the amount, the artifacts using mass spectral, and all of this. So in short, we have the material. What is going to do the extraction? And if you're going to do the extraction, who's going to make use of it? Berberin is sold even in Erie. You can find the stained berberin to, and one of my um, research, um, uh, research personnel now actually use this stain also for doing some other technique that we need for another plant. So we have it, it's being thrown, and uh, irony, it's hard to get if you're a researcher. And I understand because Pulag is limited in its sand of berberis. And then I appreciate Anna in our on and off work or non-work trip, he was she was telling me, Ma'am Lu, meron pa niyan sa ibang lugar. So we tried to look for other places and we went to Mount Data. Take note of the picture. You can see what was described as vast pocket reserve area at the middle. But all the fields around are actually planted to carrots and to, to potato and so on. Another irony, if you look at the picture on the left side, this is actual, this is not um, a post picture or, or a contrived picture, you know. You can see a piece of Burberry stem down because they're cutting down the trees. They're going to use it for cash crops like carrot, actually that is carrot. And if you look at the right side, uh, we have the, our, our contact, Jan. There's Anna looking at the berberries, which as she was telling me at the time, when we come back to this area, it won't be there because they're doing, they're, they're constructing a road, a trail road, and that will be removed. So that is already 2014. I was preparing a proposal for DA Biotech and it was approved and I included two plants, berberries and another plant which I present later. This is berberries on the right side. It can be grown in the lab. It's tough because of the cold requirement. You can see the berberine in the roots on the right inside the test tube and on the left side. Uh, that is an old work I did when I was studying you can see transformed root culture of radish. In short, transformed root is actually encouraging the root to grow profusely using an agro bacterium. You can grow roots and roots alone like the picture on the left if that is a transformed root. I was hoping I can do it with berberries. But after discussion, deliberation, and even the comment of the evaluators, they would rather not go on with the biotechnology, but I said, I'm a teacher, I want to try it so I can teach it to my students. Nevertheless, um, we did not pursue uh, transformation, even if I had the, the, the organism at the time. Tough also, no, for researchers. Application for biosafety, for ethics permit, uh, checking of the lab that it is a BL2 quality lab. We did most of that, and uh, there are coup d'etat, et happening in the country and we had problems at the time. So what is left for us to do? This is, should not be forgotten, and this is also at the top of my list. In situ conservation, or um, conservation in a nursery where the plants are. And this is our contact, John, in Mount Data, where the collection is not that tough in comparison to Mount Pulag. And actually, I went to, um, and, and, and the uh, car region, and I was thinking I was be presenting to the Pambi. I went to a town, presented it to the Pambi, and I was uh, redirected to go to NCIP, the um, Indigenous People Council. So I went back to Baguio. I was alone at the time. Went back to Baguio early enough, talked with the head, the attorney at the time, and it was so simple because, in all honesty, I can say it is a weed, it is removed. It's not used by the people, can we collect it in Mount Data? So we're able to do it. And in situ conservation can be done. That is at the end of our side 
and uh, to further use it for drug development, and it's another thing. In drug discovery, they give premium to new kind of substance, chemical structure. So sometimes it's not given identity, but we have hope in the Philippines that the drug industry is slowly waking up and uh, we need support. We need to support also our entrepreneurs and of course the people who are taking care of our soils. So that's the Burberry thing. Now the other one which I'd like to bring in is this. Medicine can be traditional medicine. It can be validated and known worldwide like berberine as a single substance and the salicylic acid derived from plant or it can be food derived and mostly like the picture of curcuma, different curcuma species here which we also worked on years ago to find funding there will be components, a medley, a mixture of components in your food. And you have heard of functional food that provide phytochemicals beyond nutrition. You take it in, it doesn't necessarily provide you the energy, but the phytochemicals like alkaloids, flavonoids, and so on, can help you improve your health and life. And as I've said earlier, even in advertisements on TV, you can find that these are already used in the media. These words are already used in the media. Recognize this. Zangetang, the, the Korean, they eat the rice porridge and you can see at the middle, there's your ginseng. Now ginseng is a mixture of ginseng sides. It's saponin in structure mainly. It is supposed to be a tonic. It, uh, it can also be used for, for phlegm. To throw off the phlegm, the, the saponin is not absorbed by your, by your esophagus and tummy. It irritates the membrane, just like soap, it irritates the membrane. So if you have um, not a dry cough, but a cough with phlegm, then if you take the saponin in, there is uh, this tendency to throw out the phlegm. So saponin is considered one of those phytochemicals important in some plants. Now in 2012, 2012, 2014, we went to Mount Data. We're already looking, Anna and I, we're already looking for curcoligo because internationally, curcoligo archaeoides or the golden eye black musala is actually um, a running short in the world market. It is used for Ayurveda, Ayurveda, <laughs> Ayurveda the Indian um, medicinal plant uh, culture. And you can see on the right side, it's rootstock. Actually, rootstock, but uh, it is also a rhizome. If you look at the structure, it's more of an underground stem, and we study this and prepare a paper for this. It contains saponin. It's considered an, um, a tonic. And when you consider COVID, immune booster, roborant, something that can improve your health is also very important. So food supplements, so good food, sleep, they always say that, no sleeping, et cetera, et cetera, that can be of help. And curcoligo archaeoides is one of those traditional medicine which is used to boost your immune system and many other applications. So what did we do? If you go to Pulag, if you see my hand, it's as small as this in the grassland, but it's present. In Baguio, a little bit like this. And we tried to find a plant, a stand of this. The problem with curcoligo, if you look at the picture, the problem with curcoligo is it is fruiting, but the ants are quite good at getting at the fruits. The, the fruiting is slow. If you look at this plant, some of the authors will say it is a stemless plant. Actually, there is an underground portion, rhizome, and the roots underground. But what is typically, what is its habitat? Habitat is grassland. And it looks like grass, so it is grazed upon. You can find it readily. It's just that when we went to, we went to Palawi at the time, we saw this because there was a grassland, but near the bush, you can see the growth of this one, which looked like orchid. And later we realized it's curcoligo, not orchids. And so again, application of permit, Etc. We didn't have much of a hard time getting the permit from Apari and the uh, DNR, and we we're able to bring in the plant 
This one is the A Biotech project. So we check the presence of saponin. This is ginseng, this is curculigo. Presence, this is anise aldehyde reagents, the different colors, the qualities. And then if you look at the right side, this is blood reagent. Not all saponins will cause hemolysis, but in this case, there are strong areas. Sorry, this is not a very good picture, but if you see the actual thin layer chromatograms, you will see the areas where there is clearing of the blood reagent, and that is the sign of hemolysis. So what we did then is to multiply this, tested biotechnology techniques, tissue culture techniques, and we we're able to detect the right amount to maximize micropropagate the plant up to the point of uh, flowering. And this is the first time I did this. And I tried this, even if it's not part of the project, to bring back the micropropagated plant in the area. In Palawi, there is now a Lagunsad, Dan Lagunsad, Lagunsad Trail. And I went there in 2018, January, to bring back the plant. No typhoon, but I could not cross the street because it was really raining very hard. So a few months later, I couldn't stay. I had the class, the, the following days. So this is captain, the uh, barangay captain and the wife. There's a lady circle there. And after a few months, Francis Aguilar was working with me for the research project, went back to bring back the plants. So that is the last slide. And I hope it gives you an idea of biodiversity and how we are tapping the plants. And just as a last slide, I just want to show you the Philippine Biorepository Network, a DOST project where medicinal plants will be lodged. This is current picture of IBS this time. Medicinal blue plants, we have to know the medicinal value of the plant. We have to secure the supply and public awareness should be there of the value. And the value chain should be there from supply to finished product balance and protection of biodiversity, prioritization of the plants, and last, of course, but not the least, concerted effort among stakeholders as drug discovery and development is a run against time, especially this time of COVID-19. And the comfort that I can really look into, uh, in the Bible it says the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. From Genesis to Revelation, plant is mentioned as a healing material. Thank you very much. Now, we will now proceed to the question and answer portion. Now, we have a, a question here. Um, the question is, Mamlu, does berberries uh, have edible parts and it is consumed by the IPs or foraged by animals in Mount Data or in Mount Pulag? Okay. As far as I know, um, it's not used in Mount Pulag, but when we were working with, uh, with Paul Elag, I was trying to check on literature. I see that in some countries, uh, it is used, the berries are used. And um, I was trying to find a way to make, to see it as an edible plant, so I can really request the A bar for the funding. You know, with researchers, you have to look at what is the priority of the area. But typically, as far as I know, it's not eaten here in the Philippines. If alkaloid is present in the fruit, it's a possibility also. But possibly not as high as it is present in the stem and the roots. Okay. okay. I hope, Ryan, that answers it. Okay. So uh, we have another. Do we have another question here? Uh, I have a question, ma'am. So. Sure. Based on your experience on those medicinal plants, so especially right now, I think this is very uh, right time uh, to convince our government agencies to pursue our studies on some of the uh, medicinal plants that you find of medical importance, like berberries and uh, corcoligo. Do you have any immediate or future plans to still proceed with the research for, uh, on these two plants. I'd like, can I add something to that, Ryan? Do you have a question or you're commenting on this? 
Uh, it's both a comment and a question, actually. Okay, a comment and a question. I will be retiring in, God willing, I'll be retiring in more than, in less than two years. But I really am hoping and teaching because I can see the strength of UPLB, even in this group of m &H, uh, um curators and researchers, we can do the preclinical. And I, we've been really... Uh, as a group, no natural products group, hoping that it can be captured. Of course, it's not my line when I say preclinical. It's more on the zoo and uh, remember we're talking about uh, zebra fish and so on. So we're hoping uh, there is a proposal, a research proposal, there is change in administration. There are so many things happening right now with the COVID and everything, with prioritization in funds and everything. But there is a research program proposal that has been prepared and we are pushing for it. So uh, the government, as far as I know, is really set on the Tuklas Lunas or Drug Discovery and Development Program. But uh, take heart for the researchers. I would like to say this, if I may say so. Don't lose heart. You have seen, I have emphasized, look at the years when that was done, decades, decades. But enjoy what you're doing. And if it is the right time, then you can do it. Okay, so. Um, another question, ma'am. Uh, I've noticed that the medicinal garden in IBS is already having form. Uh, can we expect these uh, medicinal plants also, also planted in our medicinal garden in IBS? Yeah. Uh, the DOST project, which is this one, there are five projects under the Philippine Biorepository Network. And we're starting with medicinal plants. There is a list of plants that will be put in there. Um, the 10 DOH, if you look at it, when, when, if I'll throw back the question to you, which are the medicinal plants of a country? Typically, those plants that are mentioned in pharmacopoeia. In other countries, you have editions of pharmacopoeia after every three years. In the Philippines, we only had one published in 2004. And we're glad we're connected with the Institute of Health, at least the kakaalaman, no? There is a pharmacopoeia project now and to look at the pharmacopoeia one and so on. But if you look at the national document of the country, what can be considered medicinal are the one listed in the pharmacopoeia. So we hope that that will advance. We hope that more plants can be placed there. There's also an area where the research is funded by PCHRD and the possible hits or plants that may have potential, uh, may be potential as medicinal can be placed there but there are so many papers to attend to it. And also there is a need to institutionalize the PBN because if the funding stop, this is known by everyone. If the funding stop, who will continue? Who will continue the work? There is database, there is a display cabinet with the help of other colleagues at IBS. And uh, project two, which is taking care of the materials is based in CAPS, Professor Teresita Bauranoya takes so it is ongoing and uh, we hope for a better medicinal plant garden which will which will stay yung hindi na mawawala hindi na mababagyo or wala nang funding hindi na matutuloy okay i hope that answers it okay thank you ma'am so i think at this juncture uh, we will now proceed to the awarding of the electronic certificate uh, by Dr. Uh, Juan Carlos Gonzalez. So, but again, let's give Dr. Cardenas a virtual round of applause. So the museum will also be giving Thank a token appreciation, a physical frame photograph by National Geographic Photo Arc, uh, Joel oh. Sartore. Oh, very nice. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Ma'am Lu. Thank you, Ma'am Lu. Thank you, Ma'am Lu. Thank you, it's nice uh, token. Okay. Mm. So, this mimic, indeed. <laughs> oh, before I end the seminar, thank you, Ma'am Lu. Before I end the seminar, uh, let me give uh, give out a few reminders. So, for the attendees, please fill out the seminar evaluation form to get a certificate of participation. So, the link is flashed on the screen and copied in the chat box. Um, please click on the link provided to evaluate the webinar. So we are also giving out a link to six uh,
printable souvenir cards featuring the photos taken by Nat Geo photographer Joel Sartore. His link is on the screen and it's also copied in the chat box. And finally, please follow uh, the UPLB Museum in all our uh, social media accounts such as um, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. You can also find uh, the UPLB Museum of Natural History in Wikipedia. Now, uh, let us uh, take a break. We hope to see you in our next seminar to be delivered by our MNH director, Dr. Juan Carlos Gonzalez, at 11 a.m. today. Again, keep safe. Thank you and goodbye.